volunteers who come here regularly and supported our group. And it's not too long ago that it came forward and said, you know, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I'd like to talk. So you folks, you make this organization run. If you are somebody who thinks they'd like to talk to our group or somebody in your circle of family and friends, let me know. Without further ado, uh, Lieutenant Nelson, take us back to what you experienced. We've got a whole hour and 15 minutes, and we're going to take a seventh inning stretch partway through. So uh, enjoy the evening. John, let's welcome him. Thank you, Ken. I should correct Ken a little bit because it seems to me that Ken came to me and said, Hey, I hear you were a green or a, a, a combat veteran. How would you like to talk to the group? So, I first heard of the Metro Milwaukee military historians really by happenstance. I read in the news graphic sometime in 2014 that a soldier from the 82nd Airborne World War II was going to speak to the group. I didn't recognize the picture. And then I read further that his name was Norbert Spadelska. Well, in high school, I had a football coach and a guidance counselor named Norbert Spadelska. He was always Mr. Spadelska, of course. So I, I did check my yearbook, and yes, it was Norbert Spadelska. So I came, listened to his presentation, I introduced myself, and he said, John, I remember you. And I was a little suspicious because I wasn't a stellar football player. And either one of two things, either he did it just to be polite, to say hello, or more likely because he said, this is a guy that needs guidance a lot. <laughs> and uh, he probably will the rest of his life. I want to make one quick shout out. Uh, shout out. I want to thank Peter Jacobson, who you just heard from, who for the past 10 years has saved me a space at his table, and I really appreciate it. I want to thank Bob Maddie. Bob, thank you. He uh, helped me organize my slides and put them in electronic, electronic form. And as well, Paul Radke, who you all know, helped me as well. And especially my wife, Susie, who kept at me and at me and filtered down and said, not so many slides, and finally said, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and I, I usually obey her quite well. I'm going to give just a little bit of history, and I'm going to take you back to 1968. I don't know if some of you were even born then. But I know, I know there's quite a few in the crowd that were. And we witnessed the assassinations of Martin Luther King. We witnessed the assassination of Robert Kennedy. We saw chaos, chaos and rebellion at the, both the Democratic and Republican national conventions. Walter Cronkite got on the air and said, now more certain than ever that the bloody conflict in Vietnam is going to end as a stalemate. This is 1968. And you will all remember President Johnson saying, I will not seek nor will I accept your nomination as President of the United States. And I think back about what was happening on the other side of the world in Vietnam we had the siege of Khe Sanh, where some 6,000 Marines bravely held off being surrounded by the North Vietnam Army, my, from what I've read, of 20,000 or more. And I know, thank you. Um, I remember the 10 Offensive and the news cast about that, the picture of the South Vietnamese general executing a handcuffed prisoner. And while it wasn't big news at the time, there was a platoon of the American Hell Division up in the northern part of Vietnam that attacked villages called San Mai and My Lai. And we've all heard of Doc, or, uh, Lieutenant Cali. 1968 was a year of change for me as well. I was married to my first wife. I had finished school, and I'd been accepted at the uh, University of Wisconsin Law School. First slide. I got trouble. 
Okay. Well, I will, I will continue on, if that's all right. There was a picture of what building down in the third ward, not far from the uh, Milwaukee Public Market now, which held the AVs station, which is Armed Forces Entrance and Examination Station. I don't know how, how many of you saw that building or were there, but it was typical government where you follow the yellow line and you get pricked and poked and everything you can imagine. I was notified when I told them I was going to law school, they said, don't bother starting because you're not going to you're not going to make it. So I had weighed several options. I thought being a pilot would be a good role. And I went down and passed all the tests, uh, all of the uh, written tests, and I took the long drive to Chanute Air Force Base in southern Illinois, and finally a doctor said, I'm sorry, John, but you have a deviated septum, which is a little crookedness in your nose. And they say, you can't be a pilot if you've got anything wrong with your breathing. Now, you could be a navigator, but I didn't want to spend five years sitting behind somebody else flying the plane. I knew the draft would be two years, but I didn't know when I'd be drafted or with a certainty that I'd go right to Vietnam. I then considered the reserves. My father had offered to help me make contacts so I could at least see what's going on with that. But again, that would take some time uh, in uh, active service and then reserve meetings. I want to tell you that I, I wanted to put pictures up here of my father who served as a PT patrol torpedo boat commander of World War II in the South Pacific specifically the Solomon Islands, claimed to have played cards with John Kennedy at one point. So I want to tell you my story of the th of threes, and this will go out through my presentation. My plan was to enlist in the U.S. Army, seek officer candidate school, and within three years I'd be out and in time to start law school in the fall of 71. I told my father, we had a discussion, that he said, I'm afraid for you, but I'm proud of you. Do what you have to do. And I told him, if, Excuse me. I'm not too proud to ask for help. I'm stuck on this, the ink is froze. I'm gonna call Paul Radke right now. Is there anybody else that could give me a hand? Is it frozen in your control? Oh, did he try it? Try it. Believe me, I can't help with the electronic stuff. Well, while they're working on it to save time, I'll give you a little more of my spiel if that's all right. Oh, you are? Okay. Um, as I said, I told my father, my assistant, uh, if I don't go in, it just means somebody else will have to go in my place. All right, we'll, we'll, re we'll raise through some of these. This is the Atheist building as it stands today. I don't know how many of you went through that process. Next slide. Thank you. This is my father, Roger Nelson, in the South Pacific with his boat mates. And after I, I figured out what I was going to do going to the, the Army, I went to the law school and told them that I was about to go in the service 
Um, you can go, go another slide. We'll catch on. That's the PT board. Um, anyway, this is the story of my of the three three years, three places, three days. Um, so I went to the law school and told them I was going to the service, and they said, "Let us know when you get out. We'll find a spot for you." So, RA six eight zero six. Seven three is my serial number, which kept with me. So my training, I started at Fort Dix, New Jersey, with basic training. I then went to Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, where I trained as a combat engineer. And I think today, even even now, I could still build a double Bailey bridge. I don't know if you know what those are. My next stop was also a candidate school in Fort Benning, Georgia. And, well, I was going to say believe it or not, but you don't know me, but I became an honor graduate of my OCS class, uh, number four out of 156, I think, next slide. Um, and number four out of the top five. I was pleased to do to be able to do that, given that there were quite a few soldiers that had come up through the ranks, including airborne rangers. So at graduation, they put a list of the graduates, and uh, the OCS determined that the top three would get their choice of branch. One went to the Pentagon, one went to the military intelligence, and a friend of mine, Sergeant Lovlachek, went up to head physical, physical uh, exercise at Fort Carson, Colorado. So Ma became the first one that was going to serve in the infantry. Um, and it reminds me of the story of Abraham Lincoln when in the midst of the Civil War, somebody asked Abraham Lincoln, are you enjoying your presidency, yeah. believe it or not? And President Lincoln told a story about a fellow who wasn't wanted in his community, and so they tarred and feathered him. By the way, this isn't hot road tar, it's pine tar, which is a sticky substance. We used to put it on our baseball handles so we'd get a better grip. And so he told that tarred, feathered, and run out of town on a rail, which was not very glamorous. And President Lincoln said, and that fellow said, if it wasn't for the honor of the thing, I would have preferred to walk. <laughs> well, I was in that position because I had thought the top five would get their choice of branch. But if it wasn't for the honor of it, I would have, I would have just as soon been in the Attorney General's. Uh, next slide. Next slide. My next stop was, go, go back one please, was to Fort Riley, Kansas, where I became a platoon leader among armored personnel carriers in the mechanized infantry. Now I should tell you that the 1st Infantry Division served probably five years, maybe, I, I'm not sure, I think it's five years, in Vietnam and some pretty heavy stuff but they had been pulled out and they were at Fort Riley, Kansas. There I fell in love with a 50 caliber machine gun, if everybody, anybody knows what those are, but they're very big, big bullets and they're fun to shoot. The armored personnel carrier is kind of a rectangular box of armored aluminum with tracks like a tank. And I remember Frequently, when we were done with our exercises, we run ramshod over the, the plains out surrounding Fort, uh, Fort Riley, running through brush, small trees. If there was an old existing shed, we'd crash right through it. And I remember one time going down a plain rather rapidly, you know, on a flat surface. And I was sit sitting up front, not in the armored personnel carrier, and suddenly we had a depression, and the thing, thing went down and greened off. 
fortunately, I had my arm around the 50 caliber machine gun, and I remember instead of being run over by the, the, the darn thing, I swung all the way over, the machine gun pivoted, and I went to the side of the, uh, the armored personnel carrier. Uh, Mr. Stadelska, guidance, you know. Um, I was then sent to Panama for jungle training, and then on to Vietnam. I was flown originally into Cameron Bay, kind of in the middle of South Vietnam. From there, I was sent up to Chu Lai, right in this area. And from there, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, from there, or while at Chu Lai, I recall during orientation that I got the, or we got the report that a Chinook helicopter, it's a double bladed kind of a, a big uh, helicopter, with a full platoon of 20 some plus men had been hit by an RPG and everyone died. And suddenly the war was brought home to me. I then went to Duck Fo in the southern port of I Corps, where I joined the, uh, 4th, or the uh, 4th Battalion, 3rd Infantry of the 11th Brigade. I would, I would remind you that the 11th Brigade out of Duck Fo, we had many uh, other units, but one of them was the unit that Lieutenant Cali, uh, me and I happened right up in this area. And I don't think anybody had good thoughts about that. I was then forwarded, uh, carried out to the field by heading west, outside of the populated areas, to the mountains. And I went to LZ San Juan Hill, which is our, our uh, battalion's forward uh, combat base. I then joined Company D in the field. I spent a night with Captain Jurgen, my uh, commander, got an overview, we discussed equipment, we discussed weaponry, we discussed supply, and he gave me the mission that we were to accomplish, to seek and destroy enemy infiltration coming from western South Vietnam to the lowlands along the South China Sea and to engage any groups of Viet Cong that may be assembling for further uh, combat against the populated areas. The method that we employed was using squad-sized patrols during the day and set ambushes during the night using Claymore mines. They were called mechanical ambushes. I'll explain that shortly. The next day I joined my platoon and as a, as a new guy, I thought my job was mostly to observe, absorb information so I could, when it became my time to make all the decisions, I'd be okay. I learned about the methods of engagement, the patrols. I went out with everyone every time we set up a mechanical ambush. After the third day in the field, in the morning of the fourth day, uh, one of our mechanical ambushes went off. And for a guy that led a pretty sheltered life, now that I look back, a Claymore mine at a short distance from a person does destruction, literally almost cutting the enemy in half. I recall thinking, marching up and, not marching, but patrolling up and down the hills and valleys. Every muscle in my body ached with the new equipment I carried. We would work march or patrol during the day, very tiring, and set mechanical ambushes at night. On my first, um, next slide please. This is a little thing in the, in the uh, I forget what news 
paper it was, but it circulated around uh, our battalion. It talked about our unit killing 11 en enemy before coming in for stand down. And I can tell you that my platoon accounted for three of those kills. Next picture. Anyway, three places, infantry, U.S. Army, three days contact, three words, free fire zone. It took me a while to understand what a blessing those words were. We were in areas that were not populated or should not be populated. In the mountainous areas we were in, normally it wouldn't be livable anyway. The valleys, the life was sustainable, but usually not populated. So we made, paid extra attention when we set up our ambushes. But thank God the biggest thing, the biggest difference was we, working in the mountains, did not face the moral dilemma of having friends during the day and enemies at night, which the poor grunts down on the lowlands suffered every day and every night. Next, next photo. I'm going to mention three people here because their name will come up. But I got to know Lieutenant Tim McHugh, who was from Madison, Wisconsin, so we bonded right away. That is me, believe it or not, but this is Eddie Bridges, who is our battalion artillery liaison. Next slide. And this was Sergeant uh, David Aldrich. We called him Delta Dave because he had served two tours with the 1st Infantry Division down around Saigon and some of the places nearby, which were hotbeds. I'm going to show you a few visuals of Vietnam, and I'm going to work backwards this time. San Juan Hill, next. This is our forward fire base. You can see the lowlands way in the distance, some of the mountains. We had our tactical operations center on the top of the hill, a landing spot. Our mess hall, thank God, was down in the saddle. Uh, we had sanitary needs, of course, and uh, most of it was into half of 50 gallon barrels, human waste and other waste, which were then pulled out and burnt with diesel fuel, fuel. So we always had that smell of burning diesel fuel and waste material. Next slide. On the other, other end of our base, up above the saddle, was we had a battery of 105 millimeter uh, howitzers, which provided uh, protection when we were out in the field. And next, this is what we looked at sitting on uh, San Juan Hill, almost always carrying our weapons with us. It was always good to get back to San Juan Hill because you go on missions and finally you get back, you get some good job, and you can take your shoes off. And boy, does that make a difference. Duck full, next slide. This is our rear area. This is the, the town of Duck Fall. Well, and this is our, our base with the runway. You can't really see it, but there was a very high protruding little mountain. Um, so we got bigger planes in there, but this was a town uh, that on occasion the enemy would go into the middle of town and fire um, mortars into our positions. Um, next, please. This was Tim McHugh and I. Uh, getting in, help me out. I don't remember if it was a C-130 or a C-140, but it was a transport plane. 130, okay. Um, we, the 4th Battalion, 3rd Infantry, was a swing battalion, meaning 
we weren't always kept where we were. We would be sent on different missions, and I'll get to some of that later. Outside of uh, Duck Fold, next slide. I always recall this beautiful old church that long since was destroyed, but it gave you a feel of what, uh, what the countryside looked at. Our main base um, was True Lie, next, which was on the, uh, on the ocean. It was very nice. Uh, it was very well attended. And the next slide, please. And very welcoming, should I say. At least they had a sign welcoming you. Thanks. Um, I remember later in several months, I don't recall exactly when, but I think it was McHugh and I went back to True Live from a mission. And we said, let's go to the officer's club, have a drink. So we went in, and I think every eye was on us because our boots weren't shined, our fatigues weren't pressed, and they kind of looked at us like, you're in the wrong country club, man. So I left there, and I went to the bathroom. And I know this sounds, well, it doesn't sound what it is, but there was a rectangular building, toilets, I mean, there's no partitions, they're not just in a row. And I was just drunk enough to start with one, and I went three times around the whole group, flushing, flushing, flushing. It sounded like heaven. <laughs> Mr. Stadelska, guidance, please. All right, life at war. Um, this was my constant companion, my M16. Uh, we never went anywhere without our weapons. Next picture. This is my platoon. Greater bunch of guys I don't think I'll ever meet. This is me. Believe it or not, this was my radio telephone, telephone operator, Dale Tice, who was probably the tallest guy. Some people said, that's real slick, having the tallest guy next to you, because they'll engage him first. But, Believe me, Charlie was smart enough to know that the guy with the telephone either shoot the guy in front of him or behind him. Next slide. That is me with my full gear. I'll just go through very briefly, but of course my rifle, every squad we had had an M60 machine gun. Somebody had an M79 grenade launcher. We carried a couple of laws, which are light anti-tank weapons, not because we'll never see any vehicles where we were, but in case there was a built-in bunker that we couldn't, couldn't get into. We all carried some clean war mines, which I'll get to later, canteens with plenty of water, ponchos, which we be, became very expert at stringing among trees or even grass to keep the rain off us. We did have one luxury that I don't think I've heard anyone that has presented, that we had air mattresses. Thank God. We ate sea rations or lurks, which are long-range patrol provisions, uh, which are freeze-dried, pour boiling water. And we either used heat tabs, which came with the sea rations, or we just used C4 explosives from the, uh, from the uh, claymores. We had a couple of entrenching tools, although I don't think we ever dug in because we were mobile uh, from day to day to day. We did, however, have a couple of entrenching tools, little shovels, so we could bury our waste. And by waste, I mean cans, other things, defective, defective goods because everyone knew that Charlie used everything that we left behind against us. So we were careful to bury everything. I carried myself a 45 caliber pistol, hand grenades, snow grenades, extra bandoliers, compass, map, uh, my knife that is over on the table, bug juice, flashlight. The environment, 
in South Vietnam. We encountered many snakes, but fortunately no one was ever bitten by the three-step snake, which rumor had it that if you get bit, you'll take three steps and you'll collapse. The particularly damning thing to me was fire ants. They're particularly, they're just nasty little critters, and they really sting. And if you got, came into contact and you threw yourself down and you had to stay down and you landed on fire ants, you wished you were dead. We encountered razor grass, leeches, mosquitoes, bamboo, which we had to go around because it would take two days to cut through it. Now I want to discuss what I meant by uh, mechanical ambushes. Next. This is a Claymore mine. It's a plastic housing. Evidently, it holds some 700 ball bearings. It had a slight curve to it, so it would explode a little outward towards the front. And of course, they had front towards enemy. If they had been ahead of the time, they would have said the Surgeon General says smoking is bad for your health. But instead, they sent out cigarettes with sea rations. Um, usually, a Claymore mine is a defensive weapon. Uh, weapon. If you were on our forward combat base, they would be out in front of you, attached with an electrical line, and you'd use a clacker and squeeze that, and the, the uh, Claymore mine would detonate. However, we used the claymores offensively. We didn't use the clacker. We ran the wire as a tripwire or a booby trap. Next slide, please. These are the devices that we used. I'm sorry I didn't, but we would put rubber bands there to there and here to there, and we would tension them so that it was on the plastic. If somebody stepped into it, it would pull it one way and it would explode. If somebody thought they were clever and cut the trip wire, it would explode. So either way, these we took lives. This is my P38, which opens cans for C rations. So everybody had to have one of those. When we did have detonations or, or ambushes, we then had to go and either clean up the wounded or do whatever we had to do. And we did have several firefights as a result of cleaning up after a mechanical ambush. Mechanical ambushes were extremely dangerous to the enemy and to us. And I will tell you that, number one, such a device is totally, totally non-discriminatory. Next slide. This tiger came through one of our ambushes. He was not a happy camper. Uh, we beheaded him, and uh, one of our, our guys uh, took his hide. Next slide. That was my tiger. That was me. Um, so it was non-discriminatory. Number two, it's not to be screwed with. We had a Lieutenant B, I'm not going to use his name because he probably went on to doing real good things, but he was fairly new and he was a West Point graduate, which we all pick on every now and then. He felt that part of the ambush was not sufficiently camouflaged. So he went out and he either threw some debris on what he thought was not covered, or he pulled on the electrical line. By the way, I hope I said that with a mechanical ambush, we, we plug it into a battery. We don't use the clacker. So the wire is there, it's hot. But he went out and threw something on the, uh, somewhere around the trip wire or pole and it exploded. His face was burned, his eyebrows were gone, but he survived. 
I should tell you the Claymore mines, they explode with the pellets going forward, but with equal force, they blow backwards, so there's a backblast you've got to be very careful of. The lesson he learned was always unplug the battery before you move out towards the ambush. He was affectionately known thereafter, at least among the officers I knew, as Lieutenant Claymore. <laughs> By the way, his father, Lieutenant, his father was a general in Saigon, and I remember one time we were in the forward uh, station, and he got on the phone and said, General B, there's a Lieutenant B, and McHugh and I were yelling, for God's sakes, call him Dad, will ya? So, so anyway, getting back to our uh, mechanical ambushes, they're not discriminatory, not to be screwed with, and number three, there's no room for error. I recall one time when we had a multiple unit hookup, we were given orders and I was to uh, put mechanical ambushes on the northwest, a trail that led in. Later in the day, just as I was assigning my men to go out and set up our mechanical, I saw three guys coming in from the northwest and, and walking away. I ran over to them and said, what were you doing? And they said, oh, we just set up our mechanical ambushes. Well, it doesn't take a genius to know that if I had seen that, those, that our platoon may have gone out. If they went far enough, they would have been killed. Or if they set our mechanical ambush shorter and those guys went back out, they would have been killed. I, uh, I certainly had some strong words for the platoon leader of those three guys for being in the wrong location. So let me tell you about our daily grind. We usually had missions. I think the shortest was seven days. The longest was 21 days. And we would rotate with other companies to help guard San Juan Hill, our forward fire base. We'd be resupplied by helicopter. And we'd operate in squad size, usually 10 or 12, or even three squads of six or seven men. We'd always start with a helicopter assault. I think maybe once we had artillery uh, prepping the area, but almost never. We uh, really relied on the machine guns of the Huey helicopters that we uh, were uh, taken out on. Next slide. A thing of beauty for the grunt because they help us when we land, they pick us up, and they provide support. Uh, my hands off to those guys. Um, we also had on occasion, this was our, our gunship. Now, there's, there's more modern stuff, but we never had it. But they had automatic firing uh, machine guns, rockets, and the Ace of Spades was one of my favorites. Uh, next slide. This is my guys. Actually, one of them was giving the uh, thumbs up. Uh, we were on a mission, but that's how we got to where we were going. Next slide. This is us landing. I think some guys were actually going in, but that's what the Hueys look like. And believe it or not, when we had time, we engaged in other activities. These are my men playing cards. Um, so sometimes it was just boring as hell, to tell you the truth. Um, we would send at night, we form a, usually a circular perimeter. We do sit reps, which are situation reports. They, they'd uh, command with there was a, a call. We'd squelch a couple times on the, the uh, radio to let them know things were fine. And we also were very careful to send our night logger or our night position uh, coordinates should anything happen. I always heard some reports that some platoon leaders were sending in false uh, night logger positions. 
Um, it, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that. But the thing is, if you're the lieutenant leading the squads or platoon, and suddenly there's enemy contact and you call for artillery and you gave the wrong coordinates, you won't get the artillery, uh, artillery support you want, and frankly, you could be killed. So it wasn't a good idea. I recall one incident in a night perimeter. I woke up and I looked and I saw kind of a figure coming towards our perimeter. He was walking very slowly, not making any noise, and he looked very furtive. He just, I don't know what it was. I watched, I wasn't sure, should I fire him up? But sometimes our troops would step a few, a few yards out and relieve themselves. So I didn't want to pre be premature. So I watched him, it was hard to see him. I had my gun at the ready, but I saw him lie down where another soldier was there. So thank God nothing happened during that one. But I remember it being very tense. Unfortunately, I heard later when we were up further north of an officer whose men were in the night perimeter and he saw a row of armed North Vietnam soldiers walking towards the edge of the perimeter, but walking away. He chose not to fire, but somebody at the end of that row saw a couple of our soldiers leaving and killed them. Now, being in the mountains, we had sporadic contact with the enemy, usually skirmishes with infiltrators, which entailed brief fighter fight, or firefights, and then they normally would leave or disappear. Uh, contact after an ambush, of course, we had to make sure the enemy was dead, or if anybody was wounded, uh, wounded we'd make sure that ended. No, it wasn't only the enemy, uh, enemy, but also heat. Heat exhaustion was always there. And I remember my friend McHugh, I remember walking up a mountain, coming onto their, their platoon. McHugh was half out of his mind, so I called for a medevac and said, this guy's got to go in. So I sent him in, but not before I went through his rucksack and pulled out two cans of pound cake, peaches, and uh, pears, which was a delicacy. I ripped them off. <laughs> I want to tell you about, next slide please, a couple of events that happened. This would happen on September 28th. This was called the 516 Valley, named after an old French colonial road, the 516. And this this diagram was made by my platoon, one of my platoon sergeants listing some of the events that we participated in. But this one uh, always stayed with me. My friend McHugh in oh, 2013 began having recon platoon reunions and I went to those and they encouraged you to write down an event in Vietnam so we could share it with the group. And so I wrote quite a long thing. I'm not going to bother you with all the details, but we were descending down a rather steep ridge top. And we would come into little plateaus like we were entering a horseshoe from the, you know, the opening area. The, uh, unclosed area. It would fan out. Bob Anson, my uh, front man, point man, was leading the, leading the way and suddenly the enemy opened up on us. I hit the ground, all of us hit the ground, half my men going to one side, half the other, setting up a, a fire perimeter. I could see that Anson was hit and in fact had a smoke grenade 
uh, on his back, which was burning, and he was yelling. So he crawled up, got that undone, sent him towards the back. Uh, I believe we were very lucky that because of the downslope, it was not an L-shaped ambush, which was very deadly in Vietnam, where you had enemy in front of you and alongside. So we were in a higher position, so they couldn't quite do that to us. After the initial barrage of gunfire, I moved forward by belly crawling to determine our next move. It was stopped suddenly when I looked out of the side of a tree and saw the face of an enemy with an AK-47 looking at me. Weirdest thing. For what seemed like a very long period of time, we traded a firefight. I recall even at one point, I marked with my gun where his head was coming up and let him fire at me. And when I figured his head was up, I gave a burst. I don't know if it was effective, but it's funny how you think of things. Um, although I was engaged in my own private war with that, with that soldier, and neither of us backing down, I called for Larry Bear with my M60 to come up. He took a tree behind me and started opening up, and it suppressed some of the fire. Thank God. Unfortunately, when Larry lifted up the top of the M60 to put in a new, new ammunition rounds, the fire came back, hit the top of the M60, disabling it, so I was without an M60. At some point, I got behind a tree and pulled out a baseball grenade, popped the pin, sat for two or three seconds, and threw with all my might towards the soldier that was shooting at me. And lo and behold, it didn't go off. That, that's about the time when I said, this isn't good. Because I didn't want to go running forward in case it was a delayed fuse and suddenly I would be toast. At some point, the command unit, Captain Dagger, was coming down the hill behind us, and I heard that he had gotten the gunships involved. They were coming through to make a pass. So I took a smoke grenade, ran forward again, threw it to make sure it was far enough away from where we were so that the gunships wouldn't be mistaken on which side the friendly, friendly people were. Um, at some point, again, the, the fire seemed a little depressed, but we still had to cover that ground. I think you knew that I took a picture of David Aldridge, Delta Dave, before. I was getting ready to do a flank on the right and a flank to the left, and suddenly Dave Aldridge appeared from the back, Delta Dave. And he said, Nelson, let's do it. So we did fire and cover. He would run up, I would cover him. He would stop, I would run up. And we did that several times until we reached the end of the uh, little plateau where I called my men to come forward, set up a perimeter. At some point after the firing had stopped, I learned the terrible news that my platoon and medic, Andrus Duplachain, private first class, was severely wounded, had been hit, and died. I wrote, Duplachain, who supported a fruit man chewed out the mustache, was from Louisiana, was a good man, and caring medic. Doc enjoyed a good laugh, could be depended upon in any situation, and was too good a man to have suffered death in those circumstances. All of us were crestfallen by the death, and while I felt a sense of responsibility, I mostly felt overwhelming sadness that I did not have a chance to comfort Andrus or say goodbye in any fashion. He went from living to a memory in a matter of moments. Nevertheless, I took scope of the platoon. There were several 
injured, including myself. I checked them. I uh, I found the baseball hand grenade, which I never used thereafter. I mean, not that one, but any baseball hand grenade. I'd go back to the old-fashioned one. I remember looking in the front of the tree that I was hiding behind, and I swear it looked as if a Claymore mine had been exploded right in front of it. Or if somebody had a chainsaw and kept going like that, that's how much how ripped up it was. I realized how lucky I was to come away with small wounds. I did inspect the hole where my enemy was and did find a strong blood trail. I should tell you that I forgot to mention, but the helicopters, the gunships that came in reported there being uh, enemy soldiers in a bomb crater with a machine gun. I swear to God, I, I, I didn't even know that. I, I, know I, I know I was having my battle, but I was completely, I didn't know until they, they later told me it was a machine gun and two or three enemy. I did find a strong blood trail from the place where my individual opponent was. I laid down that night thanking God. And I had the distinct smell, smell of human feces. Obviously, one of the Charlies had used the area where I laid down as latrine. I was too tired to move. The next day, we moved down the hill again rather cautiously. And I uh, we covered more uh, mechanical ambushes. The night was eventful, but in the morning, I heard what I thought was the distinct popping of a of mortars. I heard two of those. And then suddenly I heard an explosion off to my right. Well, it turns out I thought it was mortars and they had us, our position zeroed in. Fortunately, it wasn't mortars. I don't know why I heard that sound, but it was one of our mechanical, amb mechanical ambushes going off. So we quickly moved. We found one KA and one wounded with a single BB to his forehead. We took him back. Uh, we called in a Huey to pick him up, mostly for intelligence reasons. And but before the uh, excuse me, the jungle penetrator made it down, the prisoner died. I'm proud to say that none of my troops ever entered sentiments towards wasting them or inappropriate actions, which were seemingly attributable to all soldiers fighting in Vietnam. Can I just finish this one? And yeah. And we'll take our seventh inning break. Okay. Right. Um, I wrote epilogues and would just briefly scan them. Uh, another company on another ridge line later found an NVA hospital at the bottom of the hill, which explained why the enemy stayed and tried to take us out because uh, they were protecting. Epilogue two, in the five, uh, after return, I discussed with Captain Yeager how to communicate with Andrews Duplichain's family, and Captain Yeager said, that's my job, that's my responsibility, please don't. Uh, Dave uh, answered my point man after being medevaced, returned to the rear, and God bless him, but he volunteered to be a, guard, uh, a door gunner on a Huey. So I, I think you can see where the grunts were in this total thing if somebody wanted to sit on a helicopter going into hot LZs. That's what he did. I remember my first visit to the Vietnam Memorial Wall. A couple of the panels left, Andrew Duplichain and other friends of mine who died in Vietnam. I'm just going to go through my last, my last one. In 2018, McHugh and I were up doing a little duck hunting west of Oshkosh. We got a call from the curator of the First Infantry Museum who had a reunion somewhere in the south and said, I, he ran into a friend of ours. It was Dave Walkridge. That night, we made plans to talk with Dave and Amos 
uh, excuse me, Tanner's Bar in Amo. And we talked for 45 minutes, including my cover and exchange. And, uh, I always, and I told him about how much we grieved about Andrew's people chain. It was during that telephone conversation that Dave Aldrich told me that he was cradling Andrew's people chain and his arms went to the death overtook him. I somehow felt part of the weight of my heart lifted knowing that Andrus wasn't alone at that moment. After we finished our, our telephone call, another very unusual event occurred. A middle-aged couple who was seated next to us in the bar came over and said, I don't mean to eavesdrop, but I couldn't avoid hearing your conversation. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you guys did and endured over there. It's one of the nicest compliments I've ever had. So this is our seventh inning stretch. We will continue talking and we'll have Q and A when we pass the microphone. So stand up, just take a quick break, a two-minute break. <laughs> gentlemen now let's come back to order you can visit when we're done but we have more ground to cover so if you could please be reseated and bring your conversations back to a close if you have talkative neighbors it's really important now to be still please help us out okay Thank you. Yep. John's going to continue in a little while, finish up, then we're going to pass the microphones out for a question and answer. But I want to mention something I should have earlier. We lost two of our members here recently. Um, Mike Conking, he was a Marine Corps F4, F4 pilot. He passed recently, he's an attender. And Steve Stockwell, he was also a Marine Corps veteran. So we salute the passing of two of our friends. So, without further ado, John, continue where you're at. Thank you. And then we will ask the microphone for Q&A. Then we'll take a break and have him give his final concluding thoughts and so forth. So John, continue on. As a small group leader, I always faced, I was always faced with a dilemma between doing the job assigned to us and protecting my guys. I acted as a filter between the command group and I established certain things that I just wouldn't ask them to do. I never marched them into open areas. I never patrolled at night, with the exception if one of our other uh, elements were in contact and needed us. All rules out, we go balls to the wall. I think a lot of the feelings towards the guy, of the guys, Nobody really wanted to be there anymore. I hate to say it, but there were lifers that you liked the excitement or wanted to get a command experience, uh, which looked good on the record. But most certainly, no one wanted to be the last one to die in Vietnam. The favorite tune of our troops was, we got to get out of this place. I'm sure you know that one. Yeah, I will tell you. My guys showed up every day to do their duty. They had good discipline. I never saw outrageous conduct, no ears taken off, no mutilation of enemy. I was very proud to be their small unit commander. If there was somebody that wasn't pulling their load, I'd send them to LZ or San Juan Hill, and they would be burning their shit. But to tell you the truth, a lot of people would rather do that than be out in the field with us. Now, I want to tell you, not all missions were bad missions. We were in the 516 Valley. We were dropped off in the pea patch, was elephant grass as high you could, as high you could reach, or higher than you could reach. And we started down a very steep embankment and came upon, next slide, a swimming hole. Um, go back one. Go back one more. 
I wouldn't believe it that this could be just natural. It had to be God made. It was a rectangular body of water, a fall was coming in, and then on the other side it cascaded down into another waterfall. It was the most wonderful moments we had. I bought my whole platoon and told the command, it's very steep, we're taking it tall. we want to stay here for a little while. So I got, I got an extra day. So we put out, of course, sentries to make sure. And we swam and just had the time of our life. That was me up there. Sergeant Nykirk was uh, one of my platoon sergeants, a very good man. He turned out to be a lawyer, too. After our little swimming interval, we continued down the, uh, the river. We found a couple artillery shells that weren't exploded, and of course we had to blow those up. I'm going to back to the 516 Valley once again. November 1970. We were brought in at the bottom of the 516 thing. Uh, we were on in the valley, lowlands. We were brought in by helicopters. I don't think we had any prep. We found a small hole that looked like a cave or maybe even a tunnel. And it was my turn with my 45 and a flashlight to go check it out. Very fortunately, because it was in the whole line areas and it would just collect water, it, it only went in about 15 or 20 feet. The only thing I found was a, uh, a rice knife, which I put on the table. So I kept that as a memento. I think we went then, broke into three groups, and went, started going up the hill. At some point, I looked down and I saw a tripwire. And I said, oh, this isn't good. But before I had a chance to disarm it or figure to go away around it, I, a messenger came from another portion of my platoon and said, LT, we need you right away. So I went back down, came around, and joined them. But not before leaving a can of ham and lima beans near the tripwire in case we came back, at least we'd have some notice. I never liked ham and lima beans. <laughs> my platoon sergeant told me they found a well-used trail and they were hearing voices. So Sergeant Minor, Umstead, and I broke into the clearing and I saw three enemy. By the way, we didn't call them enemy, we called them dinks, we called them gooks, or charlies. We weren't, we weren't polite. They were setting up a booby trap. They started running when they, when they saw us. And I up my M16, and I was going to give him a full, a full magazine until I realized in my haste I put it on semi-automatic, not full automatic. So I got one, I got one shot, and then I went like that about 17 times until my my uh, my magazine empty. I saw one go down, maybe two. We followed, and I heard the most terrible explosion and a very light, light, uh, white light. I was picked up, I was thrown on the ground. I finally realized we had been hit. I couldn't hear anything. I had ringing in my ears. All I was hearing was the explosion. My left arm was very bloody. I told Upstead and, and Sergeant Minor, I'm hit, I'm going back, come back. So they started down, and I started walking so I could get to the platoon and make sure we weren't going to receive a counterattack. And I also was very frightened that I might walk into the very booby trap that I did in this arm on the way up. Well, we regrouped. I called in artillery, and then they called in a medevac, and I was taken away along with Sergeant uh, Umstead, who had bleeding from both eardrums, as I did. Uh, I eventually had surgery to my left arm and removable shrapnel. And my 
the panic membranes or eardrums were all blown out. And I took Sergeant Umstead because he was bleeding for both ears. I later talked to Sergeant Umstead about what happened and what did he see. And he said, LT, I saw a blonde-haired Caucasian with the enemy, helping them. I later heard from Sergeant Minor that after prolonged artillery, I think they tried to enter that, that little camp two or three times, were repulsed and had to uh, have another artillery rounds coming in. That they had killed five, uh, three by artillery shrapnel, and two were gunshot in the back. I took that as good news. I want to tell you, somewhere along the line, believe it or not, I think it was in the Milwaukee Journal, they ran a story about Doc Laporte. Well, the people that were with Doc Laporte thought he was a traitor. He had been seen in 1973 and again in 1975. But the U.S. Army considered him mess missing, so his name got up on the, uh, the wall. But if I were to show you the, the article, very persuasive enemy from the guys that he was supposed to be with, that he had deserted. Okay, next. All right, this is the last of my story of three, this case on. Next picture. Because I had been wounded, I was in the back area, and they kind of made me a, a temporary S1, which is personnel. I wasn't exactly sure of where we were going for quite a while, but we left Duck Fall, went through Trulai, through Da Nang, Huey, the ancient capital, which 1968 saw, saw tremendous fighting. Finally up to Dong Ha, past Quang Tri. Then we went across Route 9, past the rock, rock pile, and finally to Khe San. While I have the map up, there's also a place called Lang Bay, which I'll talk about shortly. So we were now in Khe in Quezon, and I know, I know some of you were there because I remember hearing you talk. God bless you for what you did. It was Operation Dewey Canyon to the United States and Operation Lamb Song 719 for the Arvins, whose mission it was to go into Laos and get and kill enemy on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay, I'm going to show you some slides from Quezon. This is the famous rock pile, which anybody who is an i probably had heard of. At one time, there was a uh, friendly base on top of the rock pile, which provided them very good outlook of uh, things around them. Next slide. This is in dedication to you Quezon veterans. This was three years after, this was January and February when I was there, three years after the Marines had defended Quezon. That's the leftovers of a parachute hanging in the tree. Next one. At the end of the runway was a C-130, I think, engine. I think most of you who were there would remember that. Next. This is what Quezon looked when we got in there, we were one of the first units to go up. My other platoon leaders were stretched around on the hills providing safety. But you can see there was junk, but literally there was nothing there. Next, we had to dig in, and this is me. By the way, I'm sorry that I'm in so many pictures, but it was my camera, you know. <laughs> so I built a bunker. Next. That's what it looked like when it was finished. I thought I did a pretty good job. Uh, we found some Konex, or cargo steel things that were underground, and they became the, the company headquarters. But I was 
fairly out on the line. I'll tell you what I remember about being at Quezon. One, I remember at one point we received enemy artillery for about two weeks straight, and then sporadic after that. And there's nothing like the feeling of listening to artillery that rounds land. Unfortunately, one hit two bunkers away from me, killing all three of its occupants. I don't know why, but the first couple of times I covered up in the bottom of my bunker, knowing full well if one hits me, I'm gone. At one point, I know that some guys, not, our, not my platoon, were going through our perimeter, and unfortunately, they hit an old mine. One of them died, another was wounded, the rest could walk back. But I remember watching a helicopter go down, drop a rope, and the guy hopefully tied himself on. I don't know why the helicopter had to go so high, but he was over the uh, runway when he fell to his death. I want to tell you that uh, as the acting S1, part of my job was graves registration, so I had to go identify all the dead of uh, my uh, battalion. On the other hand, on January 28th, my daughter Audrey was born. While I was at Quezon, I should also say that my older daughter, or her older daughter, Sarah, was born when I was in Austin County at school, so I missed both of their births, and there's no leave from, uh, from what I was doing. I later returned to Duck Fall in the Chula area, and we did various missions. In April 1971, Lieutenant Colonel Albert Coast, who was our battalion commander and CMS2, <coughs> Helen Highwater, was coming out to see us in the field. He was hit in the head by a blade of a helicopter and died. At that point, I recall, getting back to myself again, but I recall a letter to the UW, UW Law School saying, I think I might make it. I got a very short letter back from Professor Rauschenbusch. I don't know if any of you know him. He said, Mr. Nelson, our answers require requirements have, have risen, and you failed to make the higher requirements. I concluded that they figured that anyone who was stupid enough not to avoid Vietnam was not smart enough to go to law school. <laughs> but I did my homework. I had at home dig out my little memo to myself. I sent a letter to the law school saying, this is what I meant, and this is who I talked to at UW Law School, and that the associate dean had said, we'll find a place for you. And I, I said in my letter, I have done my obligation to my country. It's time to do your obligation to me. And I was accepted. I remember leaving Vietnam. Everything was quiet on the plane until we were well out over the South China Sea, and then jubilant explosion. Nobody wanted to clap when we were taxing. Nobody wanted to clap while we were still over Vietnam. But it was no option. I landed in Alaska, got out and kissed the ground. Next slide. Oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, at Quezon, this is Tiger Tooth Mountain. This is an F-4 who was dropping its load, so we had uh, a lot of protection up there. Next slide. This is again a case on, I missed the page. This was the first airplane that came into case on since the Marines had left three years before. I don't know if you can see it, but the, those are all troopers running after the plane. How happy we were that we finally had uh, the ability to get uh, ammunition and other other things in. Next slide. This is a copy of, or a picture of what the field looked like before the Arvids went into Laos. By the way, that's a Chinook helicopter there. 
the gunships. Next. These are Arvin soldiers. They were going to do the fighting in Laos. God bless them. I mentioned going to Lang Bay. Eddie Bridges, my, uh, my battalion artillery commander said, I've got to go to Lang Bay and talk with these people. So we took the ride within about three or four miles of Laos ourselves. And at some point I say, Nelson, what are we, what are we doing here? Anyway, we made contact with them. Next slide. Well, you can't quite see it, but it's Eddie Bridges and I celebrating on the way back with a little waterfall. Next slide. This is what I wrote to Tim McHugh's platoon when the drug of Vietnam was realizing after he left that he would never again feel as alive as when you were in the bush. I don't know why, but it's true. I guess it's because every sense you had was used almost all the time. Last one. This is some statistics of the Vietnam Wall. I want to particularly say all of these are, I mean, that many younger. 997 killed on their first day, 1,448 killed on their last day. That's Terrible. And with that, Kim, I think I will end my presentation. If you have a question, raise your hand and stand, and I'll take the mic to you. Anybody? Question? Now or forever, hold your peace. Was I that boring? Not really. I'll try to get through this, Lieutenant Nelson. Specialist for Michelle, RA 680046 647. Thank you for your service. You were called. You did what you were told to do and you did a good job. What I won't hold against you is you became an attorney. <laughs> I usually don't mention that. <laughs> but, well, welcome home. Thank you, sir. We have a hand back here. More of a personal question. Yes. When did you graduate from OCS at Fort Benning? I think that was August of uh, 69. Okay, the only thing, you had a, gra you had a graduation exercise, the company of the pack. I watched you. All right. Thank so you. We'll get the microphone back. One of our microphones just died, so we're handicapped. We're just not over here. Why don't you respond to his comment about Ben? Um, I'm glad we were brothers in arms. Uh, I believe I graduated in August of 69. Then went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas for a year, and then to Vietnam. So I was there in Vietnam in 1970 and 71. John, coming back to the States, how long of a period of adjustment that you had till you fully got back into civilian life again? Anything you'd want to shed to us, share with us? Sure. Regarding that? Um, I didn't have any time. I didn't have any time really to adjust because I started law school almost, what felt like almost immediately. And believe me, I'm not the brightest bulb, so I really had to put some effort into the law school. Um, oddly enough, I met a friend who was a squash player with me, and I started going duck hunting with him. And I don't know why, but it just seemed to rest my soul. I don't know if it was getting up in the dark, setting my decoys, and the excitement. But I never had a chance really to reconcile. And it wasn't, it wasn't until 
Tim McHugh's recon platoon that I, I really thought anything, and when, I, this is years and years later when I first went through my collection of junk from Vietnam. We're going to ask for your closing comments in a minute, so gather your thoughts. You've got a room full of people here. Uh, after 53, 54 years, give us your closing comments in a minute or two. Everybody, come back March 18th. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your support of our group. Go home safely tonight. And um, John, any closing comments you'd like to leave with us here after 53 or 54 years? Um, could you go back one more? Um, I did. My my daughters convinced me, let's go back to Vietnam. I did go back. Um, I did go back to Vietnam. I'll show you just a couple pictures. We all remember this, 1973. People going out. Next slide. This is the building with a skyscraper behind it now, but uh, that, was, that was where they left from. I, this is the, the palace whose gates. I, I, I better stop now. I, I thought if I had time, I'd show you some of that, but uh, we did go to Quezon. I did look for my water hole, never found it, but I think I came close. And I remember holding my daughters in front of the waterfall, saying, I know it's up there, but it's late in the day, we got to get back. But now you know what I was doing when I missed both your births. So, okay? Good. Nice. Can I just say one thing? Can I just say one thing? I'm very proud to have served in the Army. My guys were terrific. I think the Army instilled a sense of discipline that I probably didn't have before. It made me honor working hard, and I think I've done that most of my life. Um, I've always believed that it's, it's nice to have skin in the game, and I wish there was some program of the government to help America, not, not by going in the army, but doing something for your country. And uh, I'm rather proud that I did what I did. Thank you. Stay here and visit for a while. We'll come talk to you. <laughs>